Mark, what do you do when I say stepmother? I step on a crack and break your mother's back. I don't. I don't know. Okay, man, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about you today, Mark. Anyway, let's get rolling. It's knucklebuck time. What the heck kind of a shot was that? You've never heard of a knuckle puck? Whoa! Crack! Crack! It's knucklebuck time. Welcome everyone to Knucklepuck Time. My name is Andrew Apple. I remain David Hanklin. And I'm Winsky. This week, Mighty Ducks, Game Changers. Episode four, the one where it gets real because the moms are involved. Uh, we love Let moms. me tell you something. In researching this episode, uh, I learned quite a bit about hockey moms because as we will get to in the recap, there was a lot of mom in this one. And uh, surprisingly, it's not that far from reality. Hockey Moms was a great reality TV show, to be honest. I'm trying real hard not to like bring in OnlyFans, Hockey Moms, uh, all that stuff. Well, we just got very deep into your psyche, Mark. Yes. That was an unexpected early twist. Is it really that deep? Is it really that deep? Yeah. A- apparently not. We just didn't realize that we only had to scratch the surface to start bringing out your, your personal interests. Can I say M- MILF on TV? Yes, this is the internet. Does this qualify as TV? Yeah, I think the internet has no rules. Great, 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 great. Mark, what do you do when I say stepmother? I s- step on a crack and break your mother's back? I don't, I don't know. Okay, man, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about you today, Mark. Anyway, let's get rolling. Let's jump into... <laughs> what did you learn from that? <laughs> that I'm s- <laughs> superstitious <laughs> about cracks? That's not where I expected you to go with stepmom. Oh, well, <laughs> creative brain, baby. Let's go. Let us jump into the recap. I love the recap. Let's go. The tables have turned this week because instead of the kids getting onto the ice, the moms are getting in on the action. And not only are the Ducks, the reigning champions, but the Ducks moms are also the team to beat. Did you hear Emily Scott's mom was in the Olympics for hockey? And wouldn't you know it, in an odd twist of fate, the Ducks opponents for the moms challenge had to drop out due to injury. After seeing the captain of the Duck moms, Stephanie, aka Alex's boss, for the condescending walking Botox injection that she is, Gordon volunteers the Don't Bother's moms to take their place, and Alex is going to go head-to-head against Stephanie in the Slapshot Challenge. Meanwhile, with Logan MIA, we're assuming he's visiting his mom this week, Evan, Nick, and Coob have a sleepover in order to improve their bond as teammates and, in Nick's wildest dreams, best friends. Meanwhile, Sophie isn't doing so well on the Don't Bother's, which we quickly learn is because she hasn't told her parents she wants to quit the Ducks, so she's currently practicing for both teams. When her parents find out, they are not pleased, so she pulled the biggest Hail Mary she can think of and pinned her hopes on being able to switch teams on whether or not the Don't Bother's moms could beat the Ducks moms. My favorite part was when uh, the, the, the small nod to musical theater Wait, 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 wait. You're excited that there was something involving musical the I, I, wow, David, I, I couldn't have foreseen that. I'm stunned. It took me by surprise, and I wrote down in my notes, finally, lame is, yes, Coob. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, do your notes after that say tennis racket and wallet? Yeah, yeah, I gotta go after this, and bring my tennis racket and and bring my wallet. This reminds me a lot of last episode when Alex had her grocery list and her her notes for the team. Oh, yeah. If I I had post-it notes near me off screen, I'd use a post-it. Okay, let me read a quick recap of that section just so everyone who may have not watched this knows what's going on. Coop tries to spend most of the night on his phone, but that plan is thwarted when Nick's moms enforce a no screen time rule after 10 p.m. What follows is a scenario I can only assume Mark Winsky bribed the producers to write. (laughs) Coob distracts Nick's moms by singing I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables. Evan and Nick grab Coob's phone from under their noses, somersault their way back upstairs, 
and all is right with the world. Coob's got a great voice. Holy. Spectacular. Holy. Really unexpected. Not just great, but like gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous yeah. voice. And, and clearly not especially trained so far. I, I am not a great singer. I have the, the residence of uh, a cave of bats. But uh, he clearly isn't trained very much yet. Uh, something I know because my sister did train extensively and I watched her for years and learned some basics despite being terrible myself. But uh, he oscillates a lot as he's singing, which shows that he hasn't had the training to kind of hold notes purely as much yet, but his natural instincts and his natural tones, are, they're just gorgeous. Yeah. He's a wonderful singer. Th that's also the generation too. The 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 Gen Z does, uh, does a lot of pop things, even in musical theater land even with contemporary musical theater shows. Are you calling Gen Z extra? No, I'm saying that that, that is the style and genre of. So their style is to do more. Their style is to just have a riff. Their, their style is love for the melisma. Oh, melisma, good word. But uh, I feel like my, my, my notes that, that this week are so scattered. I've got, I didn't really have any, any um, continuity or like, it, it, it was all quotes and, oh, I like this. Oh, I didn't like this. Oh, I like this. Structurally, when you're dealing with any sort of TV show, especially a uh, situation comedy, the stories are broken up into A story, B story, and occasionally C story. Which we introduced this week, which is nice. We had A and B last week. They breached into C this week. I was excited. But I would actually argue that the B story was almost as big as the A story this week. Because yeah. our A story was everything going on with the moms, which, by the way, great new cast of characters that I legitimately do hope we see more of mm -hmm. um logan's dad uh I, I think there's so much that the writers can do with him it's gonna be a fun stream please do it justice please do it justice seriously i mean that for a sport that is so typically male dominated and where sexism can range so easily to introduce a character during an episode that shows the strength of moms of a broken and recovering man uh not in a business context, but in a, a personal relationship context. There's so much they can do there to both raise conversation and also get some great laughs. I'm excited. But that created a very strong A story that ultimately was able to find its way into a full, beautiful knot with the B story and the C story that was happening with the kids. Everything that's happening with Sophie being on two teams and everything that happened with the sleepover with Evan and Nick. And yeah. when you do it right, the three stories sort of meld together at the end very beautifully. And I thought that this week, the writers, the way they melded it together was chef's kiss. Just absolutely beautiful and perfect. It really flowed well. I, uh, from a technical perspective, this was the best put together episode that they've done. They introduced elements for the future. They carried elements from previous episodes. They had multiple different lines running at the same time, all happily played together, as Andrew just said. Uh, even the editing. I mean, I, I, uh, I am not as good at technical production as Andrew is, and Andrew is a better editor than I am. But like I. Again, like I used to be a critic, I am always watching for the things that fail continuity. I am watching for the things where you could tell they had to use the, the second or third camera to try and cover something that didn't go right. Mm. I couldn't find anything in this episode. This was just a technically extremely well done episode that made me like every single character more, except Stephanie, which was the point. Mm. Um, I really liked, as you pointed out, Andrew, that in her shock, you can tell that her shock is no different than her mild delight because her face is so frozen <laughs> that she's not actually care capable of showing, as I have many of, the eyebrow of two forehead, five head wrinkles. 
she, her face just doesn't do that anymore. It's like someone took a car buffer to her, which makes her beautiful in some definitions and uh, a bit mannequin in others. Editing wise, we we commented in 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 earlier episodes of this podcast that the hockey double for Gordon Bombay was quite apparent. This one, not, not too bad. No, they kept the angle on the camera lower. They kept things edited in such a way that it worked. It looked like him. <laughs> yeah, it actually looked like he was doing things to the level that, I again, I don't know how good Emilio actually is with a hockey stick on skates, anything along those lines. I just know that he's not 6'2 and 25, right. which is what they tried to argue he was in previous long shots. The true magic of this episode comes in the form of the return of the Minnesota Miracle Man, Gordon Bombay. He isn't coaching the Don't Bothers yet, but he is training the Don't Bothers moms, which surprisingly is going pretty well. Now, this was good. This was good. And I loved that he came back as Coach Bombay. That they just yep. dropped that line in there and then immediately, again, great writing, Boom. reduced it by saying, I'm Coach Bombay. I'm sure some of you have heard of me. And no one had. And he went, really? Minnesota Miracle Man? Okay. And just carried on. Just, I accept that despite the fact that I am famous, so famous that according to the article that we read last week, he is the godfather of hockey, that no one has heard of him. Yeah, I, 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 I love that too, because it also shows not just their, their, their kids that don't know a- anything about hockey, their parents, so know nothing about hockey. Nothing. Um, nothing on, at on, all. on that line too, when he said Coach Bombay for the first time, big old brain. Anyone else get chills? Because I did. I did. I'm wearing a cardigan. I don't get chilled. What I appreciated with all these little things, if you look at it as a whole, um, two weeks, when we were watching episode three, especially, up until that point, it had been basically sort of a five-hour movie that they were stretching out over... Mm-hmm. a TV series into 30 to 45 minute chunks this week, especially and last week really set the stage for this it has really become a TV show. It has become something that I know when I sit down and I watch it, I'm not going to feel like I'm left wanting more in a bad way. I'm left wanting more in a good way. It's yeah. going to take time too. Cause we have, so many characters, right? Like, and they, this, we keep introducing more. Yeah, every week. this is like Game of Thrones style characters. Like, we, we, we've Who got will be killed off first. Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> we've got like <laughs> fifteen characters that we all kind of care about. I think that's low because I mean we have six players. No, we have seven players on the mm-hmm. team, and then one to two parents. Per player that we've now been introduced to. So. I guess no eight players on the team now because we've got Sophie. So. Let's go 20. Yeah. Let's go 20 plus. Yeah, easily 20. Moving towards 25 when you bring in some of the, the ducks that they're competing against. And Bombay. Yeah. No. This It's a big freaking cast. It's a big cast of characters. But with all of these characters, we're looking forward to seeing everyone to come. We're looking forward to seeing the return of the original Ducks. We're looking forward to more mm-hmm. of Coach Bombay. But let us know what you're looking forward to in the comments below. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that like button. If you're not already subscribed, make sure to do that. Leave a comment. Let us know what you are thinking. And obviously, if you are listening in audio form, thank you. And you can leave your notes either in the review on your podcast platform of choice or go to knucklepucktime.com and leave it on the show page there. All right, guys. Mm-hmm. I would like to jump into my favorite segment, The Best of Bombay. And I think this week we've got a lot of good good that we can talk about from our warm, nostalgic hearts. I want to start... I want to start because he had his favorite line of any appearance of Bombay for me uh, this week, which is, 
during the dinner where uh, Stephanie and her husband Clark, yep. Clark, uh, basically force Alex and Coach to go to this super fancy. You know, it's super fancy because it's a weird little pop up in what appears to be a warehouse cave, mm-hmm. maybe filled with candles, which is definitely a fire hazard. But uh, big in there, Bombay is just sitting and calmly nodding while Clark talks about wanting to always win and how hockey taught him to win, which is how he approaches his investments and his watch collecting. And Bombay just looks at him and just goes, you ever get punched in the face? (laughs) I mean, in hockey or in real life. I'm guessing both. Great line. Just just nodding. Just you could see just like the surly blue collar anger in his face of just being like, God, you are everything that I hate about the world. You are everything that I effectively hid away from in my tiny little ice palace that I inherited from Jan and is surrounded by broken glass, like some kind of modern medieval moat. Like, I just, I deeply love that. He had, there were a lot of great Bombay moments this week. That one and Coach Bombay, both just right near the top. But you ever get punched in the face, just really spectacular. As we reach our final act, the mom's victory and Sophie's dreams all come down to the Slapshot competition. Stephanie posts her personal record of 40 mile an hour slap shot. But Gordon Bombay finds Alex is tackling fuel and helps her manifest a 41 mile per hour shot. But her skate crossed the line so it didn't count. But it's okay with true Disney magic. Sophie's dad lets her switch teams so that she can be happy. And Stephanie, who's clearly shot up in the face so many times that she's more botulism than human, knows deep down that she lost to Alex. And in a moment reminiscent of dinner at Charlie Conway's, Gordon, Alex, and Evan bond over a slice of pecan pie. There was a lot of pie in the episode. (laughs) A lot of pie. A lot of talk about pie where, yes, was it Stephanie that said they got these, these Georgian pies that were brought in from this little bakery in flowing in from Georgia and like all this money, 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 money thrown in. And, um, and then at the end, Gordon happens to have some pecan pie and holds it up, which then allows Alex to hit a 41 slap shot. Do we know how fast that actually is in hockey? Not that fast. Right. But but for the average person, for for the average person, I don't know. For the average person, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, once we get into the penalty box, I'm going to start breaking down a whole lot of stuff about about the slap shot itself. But uh, uh, it is it is faster. And and focusing on the the best of everything, I think right. that actually provides a fantastic character trait about Stephanie that she is Mm -hmm. proud at being the best at something, despite the fact that she is very mediocre at it. Like just Mm -hmm. very middle of the road, which is what she appears to be in everything that she does. She just has an air of confidence about her and is able to uh, gaslight for lack of a better term, and I do use that term intentionally because she is constantly gaslighting Alex uh, throughout Mm -hmm. this entire series into believing that she is as great as she actually is and Alex is somehow lesser than. And the slap shot moment where she just pulled up all of that tackling fuel and just put it into that one shot, mm, that that was just delicious. We've got a... Special guest, guys. Hey! Uh, somebody that, that wanted to join the uh, pod. <laughs> okay. So he'll be joining us. At, uh, what did What did you, you think, Pele, about this week's episode? Um, I thought that um, Alex's journey was very strong and that um, I really enjoyed the new relationship that Coob has developed with Nick and Evan. I agree. That that that's a very good insight, Pele. Thank you for your 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 comments. 
Mark, tell us your favorite moment of Gordon Bombay this week. Yeah, it's been said. The I'm uh, ever get punched in the face. I guffawed. I laughed out loud. It was, um, uh, yeah. It. I mean, we talked about it. 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 It, it was great to see him become Coach Bombay. He had a very different air about him in this episode. Like. If you look at even the little actor things that he did, you know, his posture standing up a little bit straighter, you know, his hair not being quite as messy. I mean, he still got the five o'clock shadow going on, uh, but we're seeing that evolution where he's returning into putting on that suit of being the Minnesota Miracle Man again. and. It's interesting to watch because it mirrors what's happening in reality. That's a suit that Emilio has not put on in so long. And when you pull a suit out of the closet that you haven't worn in a long time, initially it can, it can take a little bit to sort of like feel your way back into it, to have it feel like a second skin the way that a suit can. So watching him find his way back into that role has actually been really gratifying uh, to in everything that's happened in this episode so far and everything that led up to this episode you know, it just it, it's it's working in a way that I, I I almost didn't expect well interesting too that you bring that up because I I definitely feel like those are choices that he made he made conscious choices to 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 slowly ease in to bombay um as a character choice and not as 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 an emilio i feel like there is more that bombay is being given as a character than he ever has been before which i imagine is part of why emilio was willing to come back and also part of why we're getting this experience of him growing and and fleshing out this person who, frankly, we've never really known. I mean, the, the three Mighty Ducks movies, he was the older sort of father figure who was very one note to a great extent. I mean, he was he was kind of the the serious straight man who oscillated between being very selfish and very giving. Like that was pretty much his whole spectrum, you know, Captain Blood to Charlie Mentor. He's never funny. He's never he's never silly. He's never funny. He's never sarcastic. He is the straightforward, mature, very serious adult who's either looking out for others or himself. That's it. And now, and perhaps it's because the audience for this show is now expected to be older. You know, instead of us watching the Mighty Ducks movie and looking at Bombay as a father-like figure, we are now viewing him as much more of a peer. And viewing him as a peer, he actually gets to be a person. He gets to be a real character, not just a, a Jungian archetype. So he can be funny. He can slowly let this character uh, reveal himself rather than it being obvious who he is in two or three lines. And I really appreciate the understanding of the audience and the quality of the writing that it takes to do that. Though it is also a reinforcement that Disney kind of knew the kids weren't going to have any idea what the show was. Something that I have noticed about this episode that is very different from the other Disney Plus series that we've seen so far, a lot of the other series were very director focused. They, they had a showrunner who was overseeing the writing room, but they had one director oversee the entire series. Matt Shackman did all of WandaVision. Carrie Scoglin is doing Falcon and Winter Soldier. This is writer driven. If you look at the episodes, every episode has had two names on it, Josh Goldsmith and Kathy Yuspa. Stephen Brill got credit on the first episode, but you can tell he is in much more of an executive producer role as the one who created everything and these guys are the ones who are running it day to day and because of that i would venture to argue we're getting 
a better story, even if it's less visual. Because that's what you do in a TV show when you want it to be like big and flashy and for kids is that you hire one effectively auteur director and have them oversee it the way that, that you would a movie and make it you know big and flashy and really pleasing to the eye. This this is story based. This, and and I completely understand why kids are not responding to it. Are they not, or do they just not watch it yet because they don't really know what it is? Again, the last Mighty Ducks movie came out before before people who are illegally allowed to drink now were born. Yeah, we t- we've talked about this, but I'm not sure who's watching the show. I don't know. No. It, 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 it could possibly be just us. My gut is that Disney... My gut is that Disney saw what was going on with Cobra Kai and thought, huh, Mighty Ducks is at least more recent than uh, Karate Kid. You know what? It took two seasons for Cobra Kai to start really catch on, and it took a third season of being heavily promoted for it to really catch on, and then it became a phenomenon. I doubt this show is particularly expensive to produce, so I imagine that they pre-planned, all right, we're going to give this at least two full seasons to see how it tracks, how it grows. And if it's still growing at the end of two seasons, then we can do the third season mega push to see what we can make happen. Because uh, Disney is throwing money into Disney Plus with incredible force and velocity. And, And they are catching up with Netflix, which is an incredible accomplishment. But when you're throwing money into, uh, into the void, seeing how quickly you can fill it, you're not going to count the moments. You're not going to count the seconds. You're going to see if things can grow while you keep throwing more into the void. So I am hopeful that is Disney's plan, especially as we talked about with 20 to 30 characters that we now have to play with and only so many episodes per season. Well, I hope you're right. I hope that this it gets the community treatment six seasons in a movie. But what do you think? Let us know in the comments below. What was your favorite Gordon Bombay moment? Because you matter. And with that, let's jump into my favorite segment of the entire series, The Duck Hunt. Mark, give me some Easter eggs that you found in this episode. I didn't see too many personally. Uh, The only thing that jumped out to me was when Coach Bombay came out with his hat on and over some casual gear. It reminded me of when he played against the the dentist of Iceland. Mm -hmm. Um, And that kind of- Definitely a throwback. Yeah, just a casual Coach Bombay. It was cool to see. It was. It was a nice throwback. Uh, the other one was the entire storyline about the slap shot and embracing anger was very much an homage to Fulton Reed, who, as we've been told, will be returning to the series at some point and for whom the slap shot was his, his, whole, his whole hockey skill. You know, we, we watched in the movies that he was not good at skating. Uh, he could smash people, but other than that, he was not particularly good at defense. But his slap shot was like a shotgun. So watching Coach Bombay immediately lean into Alex's passions and anger and and resentments in history, rather than trying to teach her technique, uh, was very much a Fulton Reed homage because Fulton didn't have particularly good technique either. But he had a whole lot of angry punk repressed angry um, repressed anger that he was able to tap into. So. Bombay leaning that way to me really kind of showed the echo back to the coach that he was. Did, did anyone else notice the wonderful use of the TV trope of someone needing to be in two places at the same time? Pulling a Fred Flintstone? I, I got you. Mm-hmm. Just when, at, when Sophie showed up at the Ducks practice in the Don't Bothers jersey, like, mm, that, the the only thing that was better than that was that this episode featured what I consider to be... Coop Musical Theater. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. That 
I Dreamed a Dream was beautiful, and it really paid. Oh, oh, we. Yeah, I was gonna go. You're somewhere not else. talking about no. Oh, I, I I was gonna talk about the fact that Coach T had his best acting moment of the entire series <laughs> when he just looked at her and said, "Why is she wearing a clown suit?" That was pretty good. Yeah, that was pretty good. I did love his line right at the beginning of the show of. What was the exact words? It was, I like to laugh at clowns. I don't like when clowns laugh at me. I missed that. That's funny. Yeah, that was an opening line of the show when he was drilling the ducks on on having let the Don't Bother score one. That's funny. Yeah, yeah. When, when, when she was getting ready to go on the ice and off her coat, I audibly said, oh, no. I... Oh, they just dropped. I'm like, oh, shit. They set it up in the very beginning where for some reason she's practicing in her game jersey. That's not a thing people do. They do. I guess. I, I was more viewing it as jerseys get damaged if you're in a contact sport. So, yeah, maybe you have the same jersey. But if uh, most teams that I've known, you have a practice jersey that is usually like mesh and crappy. And that's so that you can beat the crap out of it. And the next, when you leave the team, that number just goes on to the next person. You don't have your name on it. There's nothing personal. It's just a beat up practice jersey. And then you have your game jersey that is yours, that you've bought, that has your name on it, that you, know, that you carry on with you. Uh, but that doesn't really matter because it was a great setup. And also it looks way better for a TV perspective to have people in the same jerseys for games and practice rather than but can we now get into mm. my favorite part? Can I go first? I, I'm ready. Mark, we need the shout yeah, out. First. I, I mean, Mark, we we cannot start What's... until you give us until you give us a little a little intro. What, do we, what? What? How does that go? Oh yeah, it's penalty box time. You just blew out the mics. Mark, hit us with your penalty box. Oh randomly running into Alex and Gordon Bombay in a random alley when Stephanie, her boss, just happens to get lost in an area and they happen to come to the door at the same exact time, happen to see them pass by in there. Was it a Range Rover? Probably a Range Rover. Um, I... I I get it to move the story along, but I'm just like, guys, come on, come on. On the, who gets lost anymore? Yeah, we all have... you have GPS, bruh. Like right. you, yeah. maybe their phone died. I don't know. Hold on. To be fair, it was a pop up. It's it, it may not have been on Google Maps. Then it was not a successful pop up. Yeah, true, true, I absolutely. But the exact timing, the odds of that happening, like, they should all go buy lotto tickets. Just saying. That was my biggest gripe. So, I got a lot of complaints about one thing, really. Just one thing. We've, we've talked before about how Coach Bombay is not actually a good coach. Um, he does seem to understand the, the parenting side of coaching in the sense of he knows how to kind of aim angers and resentments and, and help build people up. Uh, also, we've seen in Captain Blood Times how he can tear people down, but he is always much more a parent than he ever is a coach. And him coaching Alex and how to do the slap shot is very much that. Uh, I talked positively before about how he... He kind of aped the Fulton Reed technique mm -hmm. for a slap shot. You just dig up all of that anger and resentment and fear and frustration, and you just put it into the puck. And it worked. It absolutely worked. Of course, he also didn't teach her any technique whatsoever until the very end of their training session when he turned it into a moment to flirt. Um, which is, is my frustration, because Alex is trying to to top Stephanie with a slap shot. And for some reason, both of them hit the puck along the ice. That's not something that really happens in a slap shot. Because, and I looked this up because I, I was not certain. Again, I didn't play hockey. 
but I watched a lot of hockey. And when you do a slap shot, the puck is flat on the ice, and you arc your body back, shifting to your back knee, and you come forward, and you push the stick into the ice, because the stick has a curve to it, to kind of give it some extra bend. And then as it hits the puck, it releases. So not only does the curve naturally pull the puck up off the ice, but it literally flips it with the additional force behind it. So even a halfway decent slap shot leaves the ice, which even just from a physics perspective, if you hit something on the ice, there is resistance. If you hit something in the air, there is much less resistance. So the fact that he was teaching her to hit it along the ice, meaning he, she was basically just hitting it with the bottom part of the blade, not even in proper form, as hard as she could, was a real disservice. Because considering Stephanie hit it along the ice, she didn't need half that force to beat her if she'd just done it properly. So that was frustrating. That was, because kids could have learned. It's not a bad thing to learn skills. Also, I just realized, especially in this this cardigan, I do that face and kind of get a Jack Nicholson thing going. Or maybe it's a Jim Carrey as the Grinch. Um, but yeah, so that, that frustrated me a bit. Uh, I also was somewhat confused as to how somehow it ended up five to five with the moms. Great writing, great setup, important moment. But um, we saw what the other moms were capable of. And uh, Maya's mom is a speedster. So, okay, sure. Maybe she actually can win the speed challenge. Sure, why not? Um, we, we don't know what, uh, what Danielle, Sam's mom, is great at. But if Sam is her son... I imagine she's pretty fearless, so sure. Um, we see Christine, Lauren's mom, the dentist, somehow win the the accuracy challenge with one shot, which, okay. Um, I don't know. It, it was a weird speed montage to somehow get them to being tied. And I get that the point of that sequence was that it just needed to be tied so that it could come down to, to Stephanie and Alex. I get that. Good TV making. But it was weird. It was weird that we just didn't see anything else in any context in any way. And it didn't really make any sense that that would be where okay, we Okay, so I actually took that scene, actually the whole storyline, a lot differently. Uh, because I have friends with kids. I'm sure you have friends with kids. And as we've spoken about... The overarching theme about this show that we are look that we are watching for is being the best versus being mm -hmm. happy and what the virtues yes. of each of them individually are. Oh, so you saw this as a microcosm of the whole don't bother us versus ducks mentality that if you're just happy and having fun you might be almost as good or just as good as the people who are fighting to be the best who stop having any joy in it. Okay, I kind of like that. I, It's a good microcosm. We have looked at the kids up until this point, but if you have friends with kids, you know that if there is someone in the kid's life who can effectively take them away from you and you know they're going to be safe and they're going to be doing something positive, and they're not going to get into anything that's necessarily going to be long-term damaging to them. Like That is a person that you hang on to, that is a person that you hold great affection for, and that is a person that you put an immense amount of trust into, which is why it makes sense that when Alex called all of these moms that she did not know and said, hey, I need you to come and take on the ducks in what is most likely a fool's errand, but we need to do it anyways for your kids. It makes perfect sense why they would show up and why they would try very, very hard for her. Because at least once a week on the weekends, we know that from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m., Alex is giving those parents free time. And that is something mm -hmm. that parents 
very much treasure and something that they will go very far to hang on to. I get it. Um, by the way, as a random data point, uh, the mm-hmm. fastest slap shot ever what happened on February 5th, 2011. And it was done by Denis Kulyas of Russia. Mm. Happened in the Continental Hockey League, which is the Russian Hockey League's all-star skills competition. Uh, Kulyas was on the avant-garde Omsk, and his record was 110.3 miles per hour. So, that's fast. Uh, Neither Alex nor Stephanie was fast. I, I love that. I love that character trait about Stephanie so much because she is such a mediocre character. Just as a human, uh-huh. the character has very little going for her other than the fact that she is pretty and she is fit. And make no mistake, that will get you very far. In She's this a definite world. type A personality. And that's... there's. But I'm a type A personality in the sense that like, I really like organizing things. I like getting things done. I like to win. I get her approach to things. I agree with you. We have not actually seen her be particularly good at anything. Mm-hmm. We've, we've seen her take credit for lots of things. And we've seen her relish in victories. But we haven't actually seen her be any good at anything mm-hmm. yet. And uh, as, a, as a type A person, a lot of people in this category live in that way because there's a deep insecurity that tends to run just under the surface because there's a need for control if you are somebody who feels the need to organize everything and always needs to win. So I look forward to watching her break down in future episodes now that she's seen that Alex, who she effectively views as a glorified secretary despite how good Alex actually is, that Alex beat her. I love that. So... Let's jump into our final thoughts. David, what are your final thoughts on this episode? Final thoughts. Uh, this was the best episode that they've done. It was, it was tight. It was clean. The multiple different storylines flowed really well. Uh, a lot of old TV tropes that got reintroduced. Um, we got to see parents genuinely care about their kids, which is vital to this storyline. You know, it can't just be about the adults with the kids being secondary. This is supposed to be about both generations at the same time. Uh, it was weird seeing Clark say, oh, Coach Bombay. Yeah, you coach the Ducks. And then St. Paul State. What happened to you afterwards? As we talked about in the last episode, if Bombay was famous, you don't just disappear without lots of other teams and other opportunities come and calling. That, it doesn't make any sense. And so for a douche canoe like, like Clark, a man whose main focus seems to be on uh, Brooks Brothers style jumpers and designer watches, uh, the purpose of which I continue to personally not understand in an era where we all have smartphones and you know, Fitbits, Apple Watches, things like that. Like Why? Why? I don't know. Some people love it. Um, But for a person like that to know who Coach Bombay is and to have no knowledge of where he went afterwards is weird. That's that's a plot loophole that I really hope we flesh out more. But uh, this episode opened up a lot of streams that I feel like will be very enjoyable and very fulfilling in the rest of the season and beyond. Um, I would like to use my time for my final thoughts. I think we've covered pretty much everything that I would have otherwise wanted to cover, except for one major beautiful thing that I loved, which was Mm. in the casting of this episode, I could not have appreciated more that despite the fact that we knew that Nick had two moms, I loved the fact that we immediately knew which of the two moms had donated the egg. Like, yeah, you take that was sweet. one look, and it's like, there's so much love there for him. Um, but, like, you know that, like... That genetic matchup was tight. Well, yeah. And, like, I don't know which one carried, but whichever one it was, we know where the egg came from. And I just thought that was... It was a nice like, touch, I agree. Yeah. The moms in general, I just thought they were very well cast. Very good casting. 
Mark, give us your final thoughts of the episode. Yeah, great episode. Lots going on. A lot of new characters, a lot of new adventures, a possibly flowering romance happening. Who knows what's going to happen? I don't know. I also don't hate it. I also don't hate it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited that the show is now being treated like a show and not just an homage to the 90s ducks. It's exciting to see, and I'm ready for the next episode. All right, well, guys, uh, unfortunately, our time is up. We we have to apologize to Keenan Thompson. Unfortunately, uh, we're supposed to do an interview with him, but we ran mm -hmm. out of time. Keenan, we'll get you on next time. Uh, but with that being said, at this point, Keenan, just show up each week. If, if we're gonna keep trying, and we we love you, man, we really yeah. Do. Come on next week. Come back next week. Yeah, it it'll happen. It'll happen next week. It's going to happen. It's gonna happen. Exactly. But with that being said, please, please, please let us know any additional thoughts that you have on the episode. Let us know if there's anything that we missed in the episode, and we can pick it up next week. If it's a big enough thing that we did not cover. Uh, thank you all so much for liking the video. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. Uh, thank you for just being you. Thank you for being a friend. I have been Andrew. I remain David Hanklin. And I'm still Mark Winsky. We'll see you next time. Bye bye.